Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this update for global stocks and commodities for the 8th of December. Getting very close to Christmas now. Um, this week, I want to just uh, recap on a subject that I guess I touch on very, very regularly, and, and that is what is it that makes the big difference between those who get uh, a very uh, attractive rate of return in the market over the long term and, and those who basically struggle to make headway. And the difference is is really quite simple, but it's actually quite difficult to do. And that's why uh, not many uh, people have great success in the market. So uh, yeah, just a, a recap on, uh, on that theme. So in this update, uh, I want to uh, look really at the, the concept of thinking like a contrarian and not being stuck in the traditional mode of thinking and, and accepting all of the, you know, the mainstream thinking about how you um, how you go about engaging in the stock market. Uh, and basically, the best time to act or not act is when everybody else wants to do the opposite thing. Now, that doesn't mean just because um, everyone is heading in a certain direction that you should automatically go the opposite way, but certainly you want to look for opportunities where that makes sense. There'll be the normal stock and commodity trend update. Uh, portfolio analyst last week, we did look at a, at a large uh, US uh, stock that's still got uh, very good growth prospects with an extremely high probability about those uh, growth prospects coming to fruition. And just uh, at initial mention, uh, there was a, a new service that uh, was launched in 2019, and uh, we've got nearly 12 months under the belt on that. And so there'll be um, an expansion of that in uh, early 2020. The results have been extremely pleasing. So uh, more about that in the new year. Uh, American stocks, the S&P was higher by five points for the week, so not much change, 0.15% uh, across the week. The reality was that the market had got to a point where it was well overbought. It had gone up um, for a number of weeks in a row and uh, was just in need of a pullback. And uh, the tariff announcements that Trump made uh, at the start of the week around um, uh, Brazil and Argentina uh, and France was just enough to sort of uh, to prick the bu bubble. And... Um, so the market sold off, but then managed to recover. The economic data and the consumer data in America remains good enough. If you want to be bearish, then you can find things to build a bearish case around. And many commentators are doing that. Uh, if you want to be bullish, equally you can find things to be bullish about. But on balance, the data is good enough to sustain this current market, given the interest rate backdrop that we have. That's the long and the short of it. Now, on Friday night, the non-farm payroll data came in uh, significantly better than expected. It was really quite a surprise, uh, given that uh, just prior to that, there'd been some quite weak uh, employment data. So that did take the market by surprise. But interestingly, rather than selling off because the argument would be then that that's less reason for the Fed to to um, you know keep interest rates low. The market actually cheered it quite quite nicely, and the market went up uh, quite strongly. The U.S. dollar uh, fell back a little bit, back to ninety seven point seven six, even though it did rise on Friday night. But earlier in the week, it had been down um, quite sharply. The ten year yield. Uh, rose just a little bit up to 1.84%. So let's take a look at some charts. We'll start with the S&P on a monthly chart. This is 2009, the bottom, and you can see it's been on a big picture view. It's been a very, very powerful trend, and there is really no sign that the trend is coming to uh, uh, to completion. So things still extremely buoyant at a big picture level in the U.S., and that, of course, is having a sentiment effect on other stock markets around the world. This is the S&P on a daily since we had the breakout, which occurred on the 28th of October, a breakout from quite a lengthy consolidation. And uh, yeah, we did get a sharp sell-off on Monday and then on Tuesday, but then that was the low point and we turned around and basically went up from there. 
and uh, managed to gain a couple of points. So overall, there is um, no reason to suspect that the US um, market is going to do anything other than probably just grind higher. I don't think there'll be anything spectacular, um, but it'll probably just be a slow grinding move uh, to the upside, um, which is a lot of what we've had for the last uh, five years or so. And if we look at the small caps, so if we look at the Russell 2000, uh, also positive, you can see we've got a little breakout now. We're not at new all-time highs as we are in the uh, with the S&P, but um, certainly it's it's on a positive footing, the, the Russell 2000. So things looking pretty reasonable there. Turning to Aussie stocks, uh, the Aussie dollar uh, was a little bit higher with the US dollar uh, going down a little bit during the majority of the week. So we're about 68 and a half on the US dollar, uh, sorry, on the Australian dollar. Um, and our index was down by 137 points, which it was an exact reversal of the prior week. Last week, the pre prior week, we were up 137. This week, we're down 137. And um, there's really not much else to say about the Australian market that I haven't said already. Um, so we'll just look at the index. So we had a really good gain the week before, gave it all back last week, and we're still capped under this uh, all-time high. So if we take this right back to 2007, so we've still been unable to break above the uh, 2007 peak in November. And that's largely because as a country, we've, you know, we've lost lost competitiveness uh, in so many areas and uh, and we've got this heavy over-reliance on, uh, on the banks and the miners and the banks in particular are going to struggle in the kind of environment that uh, that we've got in this country given their valuations. So um, look, it's, it's really hard to see the index moving significantly higher from here, I have to say. And if we look at... Uh, this is the US dollar, so big picture, we're still in an uptrend, although that uptrend is starting to flatten out a little bit. We're now spending a bit more time below the moving averages, so definitely that, that uptrend is is weakening in the US dollar. Um, but if we look at ours, we're still sitting below this trend line, which has been in place uh, basically since uh, December of 2018, so 12 months, quite clearly a downtrending channel and uh, no real sign of that changing. Turning to precious metals, gold was down by $4, but it was a, quite a volatile week. We were trading up uh, above 1480 at one stage, um, and that was due to the trade war rumours. So as any sort of level of fear increased, then the gold price went up, but as soon as uh, the coast appeared to be a little bit clearer, then the gold price came back down again. Now, that's the short-term reaction to headlines, but at a bigger picture level, and I've been talking about this now for, for several months, there is this big overhang in the futures market. The, the futures market in September got to a point where there was almost a record number of long contracts. Uh, and there was almost a record number of, or a record low of short contracts. Now, the way the futures market works is that futures traders employ enormous levels of leverage, and therefore they can't sustain a move against them uh, for any uh, meaningful distance at all. It really only takes uh, a few percent move, and, and they've got to respond to it. And so with so many people biased to the long side and so few traders biased to the short side, there was virtually no fuel in the tank left for continued buying in the futures market. And as a result, that overhang need, needed to be corrected. Now, it's corrected to a minor degree, but look, it's nowhere near as much as it needs to be. And so I don't believe now that gold is going anywhere until that reduction in the futures, the balance in the futures between the, the number of traders who are long and the number of traders who are short until that rectifies itself to a larger degree. And I think uh, 
It's it's just too big an impact in the short term for that to happen. Um, so you know that's that's where we're at with uh, with gold. I'm afraid. So you're just going to have to be patient, despite the fact that we've got uh, quite strong seasonal factors. Uh, the impact of the futures market in the short term is just too strong to um, to be overcome by that. Precious metal stocks, uh, GDX did spike up with gold and it ended up finishing higher overall. So it did pull back into the latter part of the week, but still managed a small gain, um, which is better than what, what gold did. But really, the, the both the metal and the stocks are really just going sideways. And the sector just lacks momentum. So the gold sector is one to have as a long-term hedge against uh, general market risk. Uh, but, you know, that's really about the long and the short of it. So let's take a look at the movements in gold. So this is gold on a, on a weekly chart. So you can see now we're basically at the same level that we've been at uh, for the last four weeks in a row. Um, still within the uptrending channel, and, and really, this is sort of panning out still in the way that I originally envisaged and, and that we would get. This was our wave one. This was our wave two, which lasted from uh, the latter part of February uh, to the end of May. So the wave two lasted about three months. Then we got a very strong surge in, a, in wave three, which is normal. And then wave four would always tend to be longer and more complex, more up and down, uh, whereas this is, was a fairly clear-cut channel to the downside. Wave fours always tend to be a bit messier, and uh, we're still in that period now. So this could grind on for a few more months yet. And if we look at GDX, GDX, you can see, really has not done anything uh, since we got a pullback in, in September off, off the peak. And uh, the way the futures market is sitting, um, it's, it's really not going to change until that rectifies itself. So that's pretty much all that can be said about the gold market at the moment. Other commodities, uh, copper was up a little bit. That was really more about currencies. But when you step back, and, and I've been quite positive on copper for the last few years, because it would appear, it appeared, given the, you know, the data and everything that was um, that was transpiring in the copper market, that we would be at a supply deficit uh, by 2018. Now, as it's turned out, that hasn't happened, and I guess that's because global growth has weakened, and so really the outlook for base metals, other than nickel, uh, continues to be fairly subdued. And the outlook for nickel is only better because of the, the ban from the Indonesian government on exports, which, which pushed the nickel price up uh, quite significantly. Um, but other base metals, I think at the moment, they're still probably just going to be fairly quiet for a while. So if you're someone looking for opportunities in the base metals market, then you know probably nickel is perhaps the only area to be concentrating on. Uh, crude oil... Uh, jumped sharply to just under $60, and that was really uh, a big shift in the inventory data that caused that. There's spot copper, so we did get a spike towards that 270 mark, and there's nickel has also steadied at pretty much exactly where you'd expect it to. So we had these previous highs around $6 a pound. We got up to uh, just over $8 a pound, and now that was that was the euphoria out of the Indonesian government moving forward their ban on nickel exports and now that the air has come out of those tires to uh, to a degree and we're finding some stability around about the breakout zone which is all pretty normal sort of action so to wrap it up the safe and efficient way to make money in this environment and anyone that's been watching these videos for a while knows that i've just continually reinforced the point that if you think like the mainstream think if you adopt the sort of normal traditional thinking that you have you know you have your money in the banks and when things get a bit uncertain you go to defensive kind of stocks then um, you're probably not going to have a disaster but you're probably not going to do much good either and so this to me the safer way to go is to go for growth and the more efficient way to make money in this sort of environment is um, 
is to go for growth stocks and to act when it feels uncomfortable um, and particularly around quality growth stocks. Now, there's a number of elements to that particular statement there, acting when it feels uncomfortable on quality growth stocks. So let's try and define what all that means. I think the first thing is to accept that many traditional stocks are just not going to cut it in this environment. The level of technological disruption is just so great and so fast these days that you cannot rely on stocks that were household names and and the accepted way to go 10 years ago is still going to be appropriate. You, you know, you just can't. So I think, first of all, accept that you need to open your mind and uh, adopt a new way of thinking about what stocks are actually safe and which ones aren't. The second thing to do is to develop a watch list of high quality, high probability growth stocks. So stocks that have that have got growth because that it's that growth that will protect you in a bear market. A defensive stock that's not growing is not going to provide you with too much protection, particularly if they're carrying a high debt load, as many are. So high quality stocks that can grow uh, against the general market background, even in a recession, and they are out there, and they've got a very high probability of, of being able to grow during a recession, should we get one. Um, then the third thing is to have the patience to wait and the conviction to pull the trigger and, and think like a contrarian after bursts of selling. Now, it's not easy to do because when a stock is selling down, the natural subconscious reaction is to think, well, there's got to be something wrong. If the share price has just pulled back from $20 to $12, the natural way to think is, well, there's got to be something going wrong with the company. But often that is not the case. It's just the price has pulled back from a level of, of excess. And so have the patience and conviction and to wait until after those bursts play out and, uh, and be able to buy at that point. And that's the difference between just struggling along in the stock market, making some sort of meager return, and producing absolutely outstanding results. And, um, you know, it really is chalk and cheese. Now, portfolio analyst upcoming, uh, the 10-bagger portfolio that is, uh, is under development and is uh, panning out very well. Uh, a number of the stocks in that portfolio have also gone through capital raisings in the last two months. And so managing um, those capital raising periods is, um, is an important aspect. So I'll be looking at that uh, this week coming. Um, there's my contact details for any non-members, anyone that hasn't tried the Portfolio Analyst trial for $1. The details are under this video. And um, I look forward to being back with you next week. Cheers.